Hello. Good evening, everybody. Dear colleagues, friends, on behalf of the Emirate Neurology Society, the Emens, and myself, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining this webinar, which is organized by Novartis and endorsed by the Emens. It's a collaboration between the Emirate Neurology Society and Novartis. Thanks for both of them. And a special thanks to Dr. Sohail who organized this meeting. This is a two days meeting on update on multiple sclerosis. Uh, my name is Jihad Inshasi, you see it on the screen. I'm consultant neurologist at Rashid Hospital. So the objective of this meeting of this two days webinar is to discuss the update on, two, on multiple sclerosis, the 2020 update. And the agenda, as you see, is very interesting. This is the first day agenda. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Ahmed Shatila. He is consultant neurologist at Shakhbut Hospital, Chef Shakhbut Medical City. And he is going to talk about changes or change the conversation, expand the, the possibilities. And the second speaker will be Dr. Reem Suwedi. She is senior specialist at Rashid Hospital. And uh, she's already board qualified. She's interested in multiple sclerosis. And she's rising star in the field of neurology. And the third speaker will be Dr. Arin Saeed. He's consultant neurologist at the American Hospital. And he will discuss one challenging cases. case. Uh, some few housekeeping words. This is, you see the uh, Q&A button. If you have any questions, you can submit your question. And we, the, the speakers will be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, this is CME accredited, and you will be able to get the certificate after two weeks. But you have to make the evaluation form, which will appear on the screen after the end of each day, today and tomorrow. Uh, this webinar is meant to be interactive, so please, we encourage you uh, to submit your questions. And again, we have enough time to handle these questions. And now we'll go to the first speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome our first speaker, Dr. Ahmed Shatila. He is a consultant neurologist at Sheikh Shahboot Medical City in Abu Dhabi. I think we all know him very well. And his topic will be change the conversation, expand the possibilities. Dr. Ahmed, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jihad, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Ahmed Shatila. I'm a neurology consultant at SSMC. I'd like to thank Dr. Suhail and for the invitation and the organizers at Emmons. I'd also like to thank the sponsors and Novartis for sponsoring this event, and finally, MCO for organizing this event. Uh, without further ado, and finally, I'd like to thank the audience, because without you, these events can't be possible. So I'm gonna talk about, uh, let's change the conversation, let's expand the possibilities. Here are my disclosures. So this, the outline today, we're gonna to be having two parts. Turn on the timer. We're gonna have two parts on this uh, presentation. The first part's gonna be laying eyes on progression, and the second part's gonna be laying hands on progression. So on the first part, laying eyes on progression, when we think about MS, there's two types really of MS. We've got the relapsing remitting form of MS in which 85% of our patients will fall under. And then we got the primary progressive uh, form of MS where 15% of our patients fall. Today, for the purposes of this conference, I will not be talking about the primary progressive MS. When we go back up, when we go to relapsing remitting, as you know, this starts off with relapses followed by remissions. And over the course of time, the relapses become less, the disability becomes to accumulate, and then patients will go into the secondary progressive form of the disease. Initially, they may have relapses, but then towards the end, they may just have more progression without the relapses. So when we look at what's the difference between the R, R, R MS patients, your SPMS and your PPMS, predominantly when you look, the SPMS group and the PPMS groups appear to be similar in age, uh, 47 to 48 on average. 
They're more similar on EDSS scores. They're also similar with the amount of active GAD enhancing lesions or T1. And then finally, when you look at the T2 volume load, it tends to be elevated, which goes with more with longer term of disease with the SPMS or with the destructive nature of PPMS. Now, most patients in a relapsing remitting form of disease will progress to a secondary portion of the disease or the SPMS stage by around 25 years, which was evident in these multiple studies. When patients with SPMS were asked, what are their unmet needs? There are multiple unmet needs when we look at SPMS patient population. Uh, first of all, reduced ambulation, having increased disability, the need for using a wheelchair. The second unmet need is cognitive impairment, which is evident because now we're going from a, an inflammatory stage of disease to a more destructive, more, uh, more destructive form of disease. You may have now more disability in arm function as well, as well as visual. And then finally, all of these put together will cause you, your patients will be suffering more from depression, chronic pain, fatigue, and urinary incontinence, all of which tend to add on or accumulate to what the unmet need is. And when you look at unmet need among different portions of different subgroups, whether it's RRMS or PPMS or SPMS, the SPMS group have the highest amount of unmet needs. 70, almost 70% of patients in the SPMS group are, feel that their needs are not met. How does this relate to overall work impairment? So when they looked at patients with SPMS versus relapsing remitting MS, whether you're looking at activity impairment, overall work impairment, missed time from work, or employment, the SPMS group does worse on every category or every, uh, every parameter in which researchers were looking at. This is a group of more disabled patients, more depressed patients, and more impaired either physically, emotionally, work-wise, or just on their day-to-day. -day. What about diagnosis? Now, alhamdulillah, we live in a day and age, and if you practice in the UAE, it is not uncommon to get a person from first symptom, first demyelinating attack, to diagnosis, to treatment within a week. I mean, we have now the facility, there are multiple facilities able to see these patients. We have a group, there are excellent neurologists in this country that can see these patients, and you know we're able, to, we're able to take care of them sometimes within a week. When we go to the SPMS group of patients, they can go three to four years before they are even diagnosed. I mean, in one study, there was four years difference in time from their last relapse to when they were diagnosed with SPMS, and then there was three years. Even when the physician thought that the patient was entering SPMS, it still took three years to go from, I think you have SPMS to, okay, you are SPMS, and what are we gonna do about it? So overall, there is a big treatment lag when you look at the SPMS group of patients versus the relapsing remitting group of patients. And what does this equate to, or what does this come down to at the end of the day? There are multiple reasons why people who have SPMS may be delayed in treatment or may not really come under that diagnosis. It could be the fact that, you know, physicians aren't really comfortable telling their patients, you have SPMS, you have a disease that until recently, there's no treatment for. Patients may feel anger, denial, grief, given the fact that they're also now transitioning and in their mind, they may feel that this is somehow some sort of failure on their part or on the treatments that it wasn't working. Uh, family may have a burden as well. Uh, so there are multiple aspects when you look at SPMS, why there's a delay sometimes. It can sometimes be a result of us physicians. Sometimes it can be a result of the patients or it can be the hospital systems as a whole because these patients may require more work, whether psych psychologically, emotionally, uh, they may need more resources. And sometimes the facilities that care for them just may not be able to take care of these patients. And there has been, when you've looked at studies, there have been multiple studies showing that people with SPMS are delayed later, are diagnosed later, and as a result are treated later. So, when you ask people, if you look at, if you ask a group of neurologists, when someone will most likely go into SPMS, now if someone's in a bed or in a wheelchair, a lot of neurologists say, would say, yeah, he's probably in the SPMS group. 
But what you don't know is that almost 84%, 85% of patients will start showing sign of progressions before they even use a cane or a walker. And 77% of patients less than EDSS of three are already showing signs of progression. And this is the thing now, the sooner you can treat these patients when they start progressing, the more likely you're able to make an impact on disease and impact on long-term management. If you're waiting for them to go into a bed or use a wheelchair, I don't want to say you've missed the boat, but this is, this is time lost. So how can we diagnose SPMS? I mean, do we have any tools at our disposal? There are different parameters. And if I had, there's another conference, if anyone attended Ectrims this year, there was a nice uh, webinar, or everything now is webinar these days. There was a nice webinar in which you can look up the decision tree where they looked at age and EDSS and what are the probability that you would have SPMS based on those parameters alone. You can look at that. Another tool we have is MS Pro Discuss, which was developed by Novartis, which has been validated by research. And what, it, what does it mean? Now, the MS Pro Discuss is basically a physician-filled survey that you can fill. It looks at age, EDSS. You're looking for certain symptoms, visual, motor, ambulatory, pain, sensory. And what you're doing is you're filling out, whether they're improving, they're stable, or they're worsening. And while you're filling this out, this is the, the, the algorithm will extrapolate what are the probabilities. And finally, you look at impact as well. Mobility, self-care, activities of daily living. And again, is there a little, moderate, or severe activity? And once you're done with all this, you get a traffic signal sign. Now, if you want to go look at this in more detail, you could go to MS Pro Discuss, Google it, pull up the actual app, and you can kind of play with it yourself. Enter different parameters, enter EDSS. EDSS is not needed for this. So if you don't have the data, you can say not available. And it doesn't, and it can still extrapolate the data. So once you fill in all the, all the parameters, you'll get a traffic light signal of green, yellow, red. Now, if you get green, this means that this patient is most likely not entering or not in an SPMS stage. If you're yellow, it means that you're probably entering SPMS. And if you're red, this probably, this means that you are now in an SPMS stage. And at this point, you may need to consider changing treatment. So how do we notice change? Usually we look at relapses or MRI changes, but what we also need to do is we need to look at progression more closely. And this is the thing, progression. This, I know sometimes it takes more time and it can be more subtle, but this is where you gotta ask your patient, are you really improving from your relapses? Are you really getting better? Are you really stable? And sometimes what we sometimes account for, oh, it's fatigue, oh, it's the hot weather. These could be subtle signs of progression that we may overlook and we're not really paying attention to. So when we lay hands on progression, as you know, we have a lot of treatments for relapsing remitting MS. In the early stage, we have a lot of treatments that is mainly a pro-inflammatory portion of the disease. And as we go with time, you lose the inflammatory component and we get more destructive. And as a result, disability increases, our treatment options decrease. And when we look at treatments, there have been studies looking at whether certain uh, DMDs that were approved for relapsing remitting MS, whether they work for SPMS. Either the studies were not very, they were either contradictory, whether you look at the interferon when beta 1b, uh, it, was eff, it was effective in Europe, not effective in America. 1a was not effective. Natalizumab failed. Dimethylfumarate was prematurely stopped. So either we don't have treatment or it was shown to be not effective. Now, why is it that a lot of our treatments that are really good for treating relapsing remitting MS are not that effective when we get to the secondary portion of the disease? And it's probably a result because it's not the same disease. Initially, when you have relapsing remitting MS, it is, like I said, a pro-inflammatory disease. Gotta have some water. It's a pro-inflammatory disease, and most of the disease is happening in the blood. And most of the treatments we have are active in the blood. They don't really cross the blood brain barrier. They're either too large, they're not lipophilic. So you do not get a lot of effect in the brain. But once you go from the relapsing remitting stage to the SPMS stage, 
you're, the disease has changed. The blood act, the blood inflammatory markers are less. The, you, you now have nidus of inflammation in the brain, and this is a result whether it's in the, the B cell germinal matrixes that we see in the meninges, or you have activated microglia in the brain. And as a result, it's a different disease. And because of that, the treatments that were so effective initially aren't as effective later on. So this comes to the next portion of our presentation, sapinamide. It's a potent next generation oral S1P1, S1P5 receptor modulator. Now, for those of you that don't know what an S1P receptor is, it's a sphingosin phosphate receptor, which is ubiquitous on different cells in our body, cardiac, lymph nodes, lymphocytes, CD4, CD4 and B cells. That's within the blood or extra brain tissue. And in the brain itself, it actually shows receptors on your neurons, your astrocytes, your oligodendrocytes, your microglia. So it is ubiquitous throughout the brain. And this is the second generation uh, chemical, which was the father of it was fingolimide, which we use now for MS. Uh, it's potent activity against S1P1. It is also, say, it's been shown safety and we know the pharmac pharmacokinetics. And as I was saying, it does act to have activity against CD4 cells. It also targets the memory T cells and the B cells within the four to six hours after the first dose. You do get a dose-dependent reduction on lymphocytes that rapidly return, return to normal after the drug is cleared. And it does, it is, does have a shorter half-life than its cousin, fingolimod, and it is rapidly, once it's rapidly removed from the system, the side, and the, all the effects tend to go away. So I was talking about how the S1P is, is ubiquitous throughout the body. In the brain, we know that S1P1 or s fingosin phosphate uh, receptors are present in neurons. And it's been shown that by modulating these receptors, you are, you are able to affect survivability, neurotransmission, and migration. In the astrocyte receptors, you're able to improve scaffolding of neurons. You're able to reduce gliosis. In oligodendrocytes, it improves survivability, differentiation, as well as retraction. And finally, the microglia by F by modulating these, you are also affecting the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So as I was saying, this is a chemical that works on different cells in the brain. And this is probably one reason why it does work because it is lipophilic. It is able to cross the blood-brain barrier where then it actually acts on receptors among the endobrain on different neuronal subtypes. Uh, as I said, it enters the CNS. In studies, it has entered the CNS of rodents and non-human primates because, as I said, it's lipophilic, it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Preclinical data showed that it is active in the CNS. As I mentioned before, since oligodendrocytes do have sphingus and phosphate receptors, it also has been shown to help with remyelination and reduce destruction. And then finally here, xenopus. I had to look that up, what a xenopus is. It's actually a frog in sub-Saharan Africa. I guess they have myelin, and it's been shown in animal studies that it helps increase remyelination. So what was the study in which uh, sapinomod was approved? Uh, how, what was the study in which it, uh, sapinomod got approval for? And this is the phase three expand trial in which it was for 37 months, and then there was a seven-year open label extension. In this trial, you had two arms. You had the treatment arm and treatment arm, which patients got two milligrams a day. And then you had the placebo arm. And the reason we could do placebo is that we had no active treatments for MS. So it was ethical to go with placebo. And during this time, it was a study which the end analysis was looking, the primary assessment was three month clinically, de firm, clinically defined determined progression or the six months clinically defined progression. And the study was looking for what do you call it? I'm blanking out right now. I'll come back to me as I come back, as I speak more. Uh, during the study, we were looking at 25 foot walk and EDSS. It was an event driven study. That's what I wanted to say. It was an event driven study and the event was clinically different, determined progression. I had a mental fart for a second. Sorry about that guys. So, when you look at the two groups, the uh, sapinamod group versus the placebo group, they were similar in every parameter, whether you were looking at age, 
duration of treatment, time to diagnosis, how many relapses they had in the past year, EDSS scores, how much active GAD lesions were present showing active inflammatory disease. So the two groups were very similar. And how did this, put some water. So what did this account for? So what was the results? In the results, you had a 21% relative risk reduction in the treatment arm versus the placebo arm for clinically determined progression. And at six months, it was 26%. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people will sometimes say, well, that's not a lot. But you know what I, what I sometimes will say is that when you look at every drug that ever came out for MS as the first treatment, whether it was interferons, which were in the low 30s, or Ocrevus, Ocrelizumab for PPMS, which were mid-20s, each one of these drugs at the time were considered game changers because we didn't have anything prior to that. So, you know, at the end of the day, 21% or 26%, if it works for your patient, it works. And you know, that's the thing. That's how I look at it. If it's helping your patient, it helps because prior to that, we didn't have anything to give them that was effective or that hasn't been shown or studied to be effective. In the study, you, it delayed walking to wheelchair by 4.3 years for all patients who were uh, randomized to sapinamon. You had a 37% relative risk reduction to getting to an EDSS of five. And when you looked more closely in the active group or the patients who had active, in, active inflammation, and that is what the label's for, SP, active SPMS. Those patients, actually, you were able to delay time to wheelchair by seven years. And as I told you right now, when you look at annualized relapse rate reduction, you had a 55 55% relative risk reduction in annualized relapse rate versus placebo. What about gadolinium enhancing lesions? You had an 87, 86% chance in reduction of active gadolinium enhancing. So yes, this drug works for active SPMS, but it also works for active disease. If you're having active inflammation, this drug also has been shown to work for active SPMS or any disease, any portion of MS where you're now getting into the active stage. And this can kind of be important because sometimes your patients aren't exactly, you know, and it isn't always clear. Now, I know this is me talking now, this isn't the label talking. You know, sometimes you may have patients where you think they're entering into the SPMS stage and they do have active inflammation and you know this drug at this point in time still may be effective for them. What about uh, cognitive ability? When we look at the single digit modality test, this is basically the test where you got to connect the dots, 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D. And what they did was, and what they noticed is that the longer you were treated on sapinamod, the better you did on this test, versus when you were on placebo, you didn't do as well. How about safety? Now, in regards to safety, I told you this is the parent compound is fingolimod. So if you have used fingolimod or you know how to use fingolimod, you can expect the same type of safety profile. With one exception, I'll get to it. You do expect to get lymphopenia because there are sphingus and phosphate receptors in the lymph nodes and this still affects lymph nodes. You still, get, you still can expect LFT greater than uh, three times the upper limit of normal in some patients. You gotta keep an eye for, eye for that. You gotta worry about herpes zosters and you gotta check for macular edema. The only difference between sapinamod and fingolimod is that in fingolimod, you affect the, the SPU3 and 4 receptors, as well as 5, and they do play a role in bradycardia, and you need the six-hour monitoring. Because sapinamod is only 1 in 5, and you don't get also, you don't get the other SP, SP3 and 4 receptors, so you don't get the significant bradycardia. And as a result, you don't need the six-hour monitoring. And this was shown in this study, in which patients who got sapinamod, two milligrams, did not get the fluctuating bradycardia. And as a result, that is why you do not need to do the six-hour dose monitoring for first dose of sapinamod unless you have cardiac risk factors or you have a high risk of cardiac issues. So in conclusion, what, is, what, have, I, what have I shown or what have I told about today? At the end of the day, this is the only this was the first drug, and it is the only drug that was actively looked at in a phase three trial for, SP, for SPMS. And what you showed, you had a 20% relative risk reduction in 
uh, clinically de uh, defined progression, three months, 26% at six months. It has also been shown to reduce relapse rates of 55%. You do get a change in brain volume, 23% reduced brain volume or a slower, a better brain volume than placebo. It improves cognitive speed, as I told you with the single digit modality test and time the wheelchair seven years for active SPMS patients people who had active inflammatory, active GAD, and the safety profile, what I have told you. So now, what do you need to know before you prescribe cetinibod? Uh, you need to check the cytochrome CYP2C9 system. This is a test, so why you need to check for this? Because this drug is metabolized by the cytochrome 2C9 system in the liver. And because of this, the dosing of it, your dosing will change. Uh, this is a service offered by Novartis. Uh, in it, you will get allelic testing, whether your patient's an extensive metabolizer, an intermediate metabolizer, or a poor metabolizer. Now, I currently have two patients that I'm working up on Cepinomod. One of them turned out to be an extensive metabolizer. The other one is an intermediate. So because of that, we'll go to the next slide. If you are an extensive metabolizer, you can take two milligrams per day. But you can't take two milligrams right off the bat. You got to get a dose titration. So initially you go with 0.25 for the first two days, 0.5 milligrams for third day, 0.75 for the fourth day, 1.25 on the fifth day, then you go two milligrams thereafter. If you are an intermediate metabolizer, you still get titrated. You go 0.25 the first and second day, which is shown on this graph. You take 0.5 on the third day, 0.75 on the fourth day, 1.25 on the fifth day, but then you go back to one. Now, why do you go up to 1.25, then you go back to one? I'm not quite sure. And I actually asked Novartis that same question. Why do we got to go up to go back down? Uh, that's how the drug was studied. Uh, so you do that. Uh, it does come in a, in a kit by itself, so your patients can easily take the medicine. So as I told you, your pre-initiation screening, you got to check the blood. You got to check your CYP2C9 genotype testing, which is available by Novartis, free for your patients. You have to check that your patient is not pregnant, and you do the, have to do the cardiovascular assessment, which is an EKG. Now, if you've missed four doses of cepinimod, you got to start all over. And if your patient needed to be monitored for six hours, you need to do that again. Uh, as I told you, assessment prior to first dose, this is just a re just, uh, repeat of what I've just said. You, so before you start the first dose, you need to check the CYP2C9 genotype, which is again offered by Novartis free of charge for your patient, and they will come to the house and they will check it. Your CBC was checking what their baseline lymphocyte count is. They need to go to ophthalmology to rule out macular edema, uh, cardiac eval, ECG. You need to make sure that, just like Fingolimod, you need to make sure they're not on any neoplastics drugs. They are not immunosuppressed. If they're not VZV immunized, or if they're not immune to VZV, you do need to vaccinate them first with their first dose, then you repeat a booster dose six weeks later, and then I usually wait six weeks after their booster dose to give it to start the medication. And then you get a baseline LFT. So with that, I will tell you thank you very much, and I finished at 24 minutes, 52 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Very nice, informative lecture. Uh, please stay with us to the end because some questions will be directed to you. And now we move to our next uh, speaker, next topic. It's my pleasure to invite and welcome Dr. Reem Suwedi. She is a specialist neurologist at Rashid Hospital. She's board certified and uh, she's promising in the field of multiple sclerosis. She's very active in seeing patients involved in research publication, so it's my pleasure to have her with us. And her presentation will be very hot topic, MS and COVID, in COVID era. So Dr. Reem, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Dr. Jad, for this kind introduction. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to present for you MS and COVID-19 era. I'm Dr. Reem Sawedi, neurologist and Rashid Hospital. So as usual, to start with a case, just to get things uh, interested. Uh, we have a 33 years old Emirati man who came with a history of recent relapse, that was brainstem, 
uh, including diplopia, ataxia, in February 2020. He received IV methylprednisolone with partial recovery. He presented to our hospital for further management of his disease. He gave us a history of dizziness that started in 2011 that did not improve uh, completely and was there. Since 2015, he'd been having some urinary and sexual dysfunction as well. Few months before pre presenting to our hospital, he'd been experiencing uh, Lermit phenomena, and on his examination, he has an EDSS of four. His MRI or investigation was, cons was consistent with MS that was active and progressed. So how we would have treated this patient? In March 2020, which is the time that we were choosing his disease-modifying therapy, COVID-19 was declared as a pandemic. So that will change our decision. Before that, we would have chose one of these medications. So actually, to make uh, you interactive with me, I will start the poll. So I want you to choose which disease-modifying therapy you would have started this patient on just before March 2020. So you have the pool now, question one. So think before March 2020, what you have chosen this patient on. So like, Last year, patient presented with these symptoms, EDSS of four, MRI is active, progressive, young patient. What was your choice? Okay, I think that is enough time. So let's share the result and see. Almost 40% would have started this patient on interferon or GA. Some few showed pingolamod, metazolimab, and lesser percentage went to the advanced therapy. Okay. Now that actually pandemic is announced and it's March 2020, would that change your decision? Okay. So let's have another poll. Choose the second question. Now I want you to think at this moment. Now we have a pandemic. Few more seconds. And we can share the result. Okay. I think they did not notice that the first question was before the pandemic. This is my book. Okay. I, 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 yeah, yes, Victor Jad. I think that because March 2020 was there. Yeah, yes. It should be reversed. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. No problem. We'll continue so they will know the point of that. So resume. Actually, delaying the treatment or de escalating. Okay. De-escalating therapy, switching to immunomodulatory disease modifying, that might lead to delay adequate treatment of our MS patient. Because COVID-19 is actually with us for months now, and potentially it might continue for years. And number of confirmed cases are passed over 39 million globally, and more than 1 million death was actually there. So the national professional bodies, the patient organization, they responded very rapidly in issuing a guidelines that was actually only a few months published after declaring the pandemic, mainly focusing on the disease modifying therapies that we'll be speaking about later on. So we can go through initial observation of uh, some publication study that was published uh, two months after declaring pandemic. We have very from the uh, Pacific Northwest where they reported eight of their MS patients who had COVID-19 infection. Mostly they were female, as usual, aged from 35 to 74, and most of them were relapsing, grammatic MS. 
most of them had a lower disability uh, scale, exception of two who had 7.8 and 8.5 uh, ADSS. They were on different disease modifying therapy, um, some for injectable, two were on dimethyl fumarate, fingolimod, and troponinamide, and one of them were not receiving any disease modifying therapy. Their COVID symptom lasted between six to 28 days, and most of the patients did not require hospitalization. Only three they were, and one of them were mainly for observation. Two patients of the reported eight patients died actually, and these two patients were severely affected with both COVID-19 and MS. They were the patient with uh, increased EDSS score, and they have other significant comorbidity. Both of the, these patients had a low lymphocyte count, and one of them had increased LFT. These mainly were, were a response to COVID-19 infection because prior to the infection itself, their uh, laboratory testing were within normal. So most of their patients remained on their disease-modifying ther therapy without interruption, and because most of them had a mild COVID-19 infection. The fatal outcome, as we said, were more with the advanced MS and advanced infection as well. However, these observations were lacking the disease uh, cell depleting therapy, so we cannot generalize uh, their observation. So another observation study from NYU with a, a bit larger population, they had 76 patients. As usual, more are uh, relapsing remitting MS, and of them, 84% were in disease modifying therapy, and 44% of them were an anti-CD20 therapy. 13.5 when was an S1P uh, receptor modulator. So what did they uh, observe? That the most common symptom of COVID-19 were fever and cough, but 21% of them had some neurological, uh, neurological symptom that coinciding with the infection itself. 23% were only hospitalized, but 10% has actually critically ill uh, illness. And what was their feature that was reported? Actually, patients who were at older age, who had a lot of comorbidities, have progressive disease, and the non-ambulatory status. But none of the uh, associated factor was because of the DMTs that require hospitalization or fatal outcome. So in conclusion, from this observational study, most of MS patients who had COVID-19 did not require hospitalization despite being on DMTs. As we said, 44% were on anti-CD20. The factor that was associated with the critical illness was similar to the general population. MS itself and DMT was not a predictor for poor outcome. But as always, we need a larger data, something more. So we'll move to the COVID registry, where they actually reported 347 patients. The median, uh, the mean age was 44.6, with a female predominant of 249 patients. The mean disease duration were 13.5, and among uh, subgroup of the disease course, the relapsing remitting has the majority uh, of patients. Their EDSS were ranging from 0 to 9.5 of uh, median of 2, and 82% were in disease-modifying therapy. So that's a large number of patients on disease-modifying therapy. And we can see here more than 15% were in advanced therapy, ocrelizumab, rotuximab, cladribine, and alentuzumab. They also reported the other significant comorbidities of these patients. And their COVID-19 um, diagnosis was made on the polymerase chain reaction, uh, their uh, COVID-19 typical symptom, and the CT uh, chest finding. So, uh, wh why we are why we did we choose this study? Because we wanted to associate the disease, if there is any association between disease modifying therapy and severe outcome. So the main outcome of this observational study was the severity of COVID-19, and it was assessed 
on a seven point uh, ordinal scale ranging from one to seven. One will be no hospitalization required, no limitation of activity, seven is death. The cutoff score was three, where the patient will be hospitalized, but no need for oxygen supplementation. The interesting finding in this graph is that differentiation between the patient with no treatment and the patient who was on disease-modifying therapy. Actually, the no treatment uh, group has a worse COVID-19 outcome. 46% were scored three and above, comparing to 15.5% only in a patient who are receiving disease-modifying therapy. Using the univariate, uh, univariate analysis, they identified age, EDSS, and obesity as independent risk factor for severe uh, COVID-19 outcome, as we said, scoring three or more. And that was confirmed as well with a multivariant analysis. So this data does support the, and recommend, reinforce not to stopping DMT and not delaying this treatment as it was not associated with severe outcome, especially with a patient with a high disease inflammatory activity and high risk of relapse, subsequently leading to high disability. As we mentioned, uh, moving now to the disease-modifying therapy uh, recommendation that was published in April, uh, just two months after declaring the pandemic. So the recommendation was to continue current disease-modifying therapy of the patient, specifically if they were on first line or fingolimod or natazolimab. Special precaution was for patients receiving lymphodepleting DMT, and it should be based on individual circumstances to delay starting such a lymph-depleting medication as ocrelizumab, alemtuzumab, and cladribine or temporarily redu uh, delaying the redosing, especially uh, of these patients. And as we said, depend on the disease activity and the severity of uh, the disease itself. Risk factor of uh, uh, contracting infection will increase 50% if the lymphocyte count was uh, below 800. And for anti-CD20, what is the guide to delay next dose? Is the CD19 and CD20 lymphocyte count before the next dose? So they subdivided the medication into category risk. So the low, very low category uh, risk are the interferon, GA, and triflunamide. And of these medications are safe to start and safe to continue even during the COVID-19 infection itself. The low risk category are the dimethyl fumarate and natazolumab, and it's probably safe to start them and even to continue during a COVID-19 infection. Maybe with the natazolumab, we can uh, use the uh, extended doses instead of four weeks, six to eight weeks uh, dosing. What about the intermediate risk? They are the S1 modulator, uh, anti-CD20, and cladropine, which is, they said, probably safe to start, and for S1P, safe to continue during uh, COVID-19 infection, but CD20 and cladropine, as we said, delay dosing might be considered, depending, as we said, severity of the disease and the activity of it, uh, MS itself. The high-risk category, which is metazantron and alemtuzumab, not to start it, and of course, to suspend it in case of COVID-19 infection. Um, going to a recent uh, published article, uh, article uh, regarding treating MS uh, during the COVID-19, general advice uh, regarding special precaution for our MS patients. The risk of respiratory infection. We know there are there is an increased risk of pneumonia, influenza, hospitalization of our MS patient comparing to general population, and the risk factor for hospitalization are identified as older age, male sex, worse 
physical disability and lower socioeconomic uh, status. What are the general advice that we should tell our patient? Of course, recommending social distancing, hand washing, educate them about the symptom of COVID-19 infection itself. Of course, telling them no change in MS treatment should be done without consulting the neurologist. How, uh, as we said, we just went through the recommendation. The recommendation is continue during mild and by, uh, mild uh, infection, not to stopping our DNT, uh, uh, unless patient has severe or complicated COVID-19 infection that require hospitalization. Stopping treatment during that period uh, can be considered and restarting after four weeks or when the symptoms are fully recovered. Keeping in mind S1P modulator and natazolumab having a rebound MS activity after this stopping period. What about managing a patient without COVID-19 infection? So our MS patient came with an acute relapse. We know the uh, short-term IV corticosteroid uh, to hasten the recovery. Uh, it's associated with increased, uh, unfortunately, herpes virus reactivation. And before giving the IV methylprednisolone, a screening for COVID-19 infection should be done for each and every patient. How did COVID-19 change our service delivery to the patient? Most of the center, as well as our center, are using telemedicine to reduce hospital visit. Uh, what are the other parameters that can be done is delivering medication to, to the patient doorstep, as well as delaying uh, follow-up MRI of a stable patient, uh, reducing the laboratory monitoring of a patient who are stable, uh, as well as using high dose oral corticosteroid instead of IV, as it's shown to be uh, equally effective as well as uh, reducing, uh, as we said, spacing up the infusion to reduce the load on the infusion center, especially if they are underemployed. Uh, These are mainly the general advice and how the COVID-19 actually changed our uh, um, understanding of uh, delivering the service to the patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reeb. I was reviewing the questions. Uh, so very nice presentation. You stay with us again. There are many questions directed to you about COVID and MS. And I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ari Saeed. I think we all know him. He's a consultant neurologist at the American Hospital. He is American board certified and he's a fellow in neuroimmunology. And I want to remind you that in our last MNs, Dr. Arian, uh, won the first prize in the quiz we did it in the last day, I think. I will not uh, tell what was the prize, but he was the winner, the first winner. So your presentation will be a challenging case in multiple sclerosis. Please, Dr. Arian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, we see you. And Thank we see you so your uh, slide. All right. So um, I just want like to start by pulling a question to uh, the audience. Uh, if you can uh, just answer how many of you are neurologists or general practitioners, uh, nurses, uh, if you please. Okay, so roughly speaking, 10% uh, uh, neurologists, 10% general practitioners, uh, many nurses, uh, uh, almost 30% and others could be medical students or uh, uh, pharmacists or other uh, healthcare uh, light uh, people. Thank you. Okay, so uh, 
Allow me really to thank you all, uh, first the organizers, for inviting me to be part of this program. I'd like to thank also the audience for attending this program. And uh, I was uh, assigned to give a talk about uh, challenging MS case and management. And I opted in this era of uh, uh, progressive uh, MS to talk about lookalikes of MS uh, as we have seen many patients who could be uh, overdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Uh, the, uh, asp the, th this talk will actually uh, have a format of a few cases. Uh, there are 10 cases. If time allow, we will go through the 10 cases. If not, we will modify the presentation to help you get the most uh, advantage of it. All right, Let's see here. Okay, so we'll start by this uh, gentleman. He is a 52-year-old male. Uh, he came uh, uh, years ago with progressive left facial weakness. Uh, weeks and months uh, after, he started to have progressive uh, left-sided uh, weakness and slurred speech. At that time, uh, he was suspected uh, to have a diagnosis of MS, and uh, that was based on an MRI that mainly showed this... Uh, right more than left uh, hemispheric, non-specific high signal uh, flare uh, images as uh, observed. Uh, and he was initially uh, thought to have uh, PPMS uh, and was initiated on interferon beta 1A and steroids uh, years uh, ago when there was no therapy for uh, primary progressive MS. His exam uh, uh, revealed uh, no significant uh, visual field defects he has no uh, optic uh, neuritis. He was uh, inattentive, had spastic dysarthria. Uh, there was associated left facial weakness and left spastic hemiparesis with normal right side and uh, normal sensory exam. So if you look back at his um, uh, imaging studies, you can uh, see these uh, high signal abnormalities uh, and his uh, C-spine, T-spine were normal. His autoimmune and infectious laboratory workup was unremarkable. Negative oligoclonal bands, negative cytology, uh, negative JC PCR. Uh, so the diagnosis was actually false because when you observe this MRI, you can see that uh, there is slight loss of the gray water matter differentiation uh, on the right side. You can also notice that there is slight midline shift. So that actually should uh, deviate your uh, thought from uh, MS whether it is relapsing, remitting, or uh, primary progressive. This gentleman, unfortunately, had what we know as gliomatosis cerebri, which is a rare uh, diffuse infiltrating astrocytoma that can affect uh, multiple lobes. Uh, it can be de novo or from a glial tumor. Usually, patients present with focal deficits, altered mental status, seizures, or symptoms and signs of increased intracranial pressure. The major differential uh, should be MS, uh, vasculitis, uh, and progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. MRI is a better modality uh, in diagnosing these patients than CT scan. Uh, remember that two thirds of these people can have non-enhancing uh, lesions, uh, but usually there is loss of a gray white matter differentiation. Treatment is whole brain radiation. That's why he did not respond to the standard uh, interferon therapy or other MS therapy. Prognosis, uh, usually 14 to 18 months survival, but there are some papers that report nine to 36 months. I'd like to take you to the second case, which is a 41 year old male. Uh, he came with a progressive left upper and lower extremity stiffness and weakness. He actually had some uh, apraxia where his left hand was always touching his uh, shirt and uh, uh, buttons. Uh, he progressed to have bilateral lower extremity spasticity with spastic dysarthria. There was no family history of MS or demyelinating disease. His exam mainly showed uh, spastic dysarthria and brisk Georgia cliff lips with a moderate degree of uh, uh, left greater than right hemiparesis, normal sensation, and hemiparetic gait. If you hear this patient without any imaging study, you may start to think of motor neuron disease. However, his imaging studies revealed this um, bilateral right more than left, relatively confluent high signal abnormalities, 
uh, with uh, normal C-spine uh, and T-spine MRI. Uh, infectious and inflammatory markers were negative. Uh, CSF revealed no uh, oligoclonal bands or elevation in IgG index. Remember that recently there is a lot of papers that actually refer to high lesion load in the spinal cord in MS patients. So uh, doing an MRI of the cervical spine and T-spine uh, in an individual that you suspect uh, have MS, there should be high likelihood that they have lesions in the spinal cord, different uh, uh, publication between 30 to 70 percent. This individual, uh, because of uh, all his findings and the significant degree of the brain atrophy, which still could be seen in MS patient, ended up having uh, a brain biopsy. Uh, this is from a textbook. Uh, the brain biopsy showed these uh, uh, axonal spheroids with uh, uh, some eosinophilic staining. And this is really uh, typical of a disease that mimic primary progressive MS uh, called adult onset leak encephalopathy with the neuroaxonal spheroids. Uh, it's important to uh, know about this pathology. It is uh, first described in the early 1980s. Average age of an onset is similar to those patients with the primary progressive MS, around uh, 40 uh, years of age. Uh, most frequent symptoms are cognitive decline, behavioral and personality changes, and motor symptoms. Rarely those patients can present with Parkinsonism, tremor, and uh, seizures. Uh, this disease may mimic also what uh, we know about autosomal dominant glycodystrophy that can also start at young age. However, autonomic dysfunction uh, is not common in uh, adult onset leukoencephalopathy with axonal spheroids, and also cognitive uh, dysfunction is uncommon, uh, on the other hand, with autosomal dominant leukodystrophy. Uh, the latter can, could also be associated with uh, middle cerebellar peduncle lesions on the brain MRI and uh, involvement of the corticospinal tract and thinning of the cervical spinal cord on uh, MRI images. Let's move to the third patient, who is a 59-year-old gentleman, had progressive gait abnormality uh, and uh, slight personality change uh, for one year. He was having frequent falls. Sometimes he tremble when he stands and does uh, lawn work. Uh, he received steroids and that didn't help him. We will come to his imaging studies uh, to uh, explain why did he receive the steroids. On his exam, he was dysarthic. Uh, he had a combination of spastic and hypophonic voice. Uh, he had normal motor exam reflexes, uh, bilateral uh, plantar reflexes, uh, and uh, had uh, a toxic wide base gait. This is his uh, MRI of the brain. You can see a typical um, high signal abnormalities on bilateral middle cerebellar peduncles. Uh, this patient also had few lesions in the deep white matter, but they were non-specific. Uh, but some people could uh, believe that they are MS demyelinating lesions. Uh, further testing to this patient, including the routine tests that we do for uh, uh, infectious etiologists like Lyme disease, angiotensin converting enzyme for sarcoidosis, other inflammatory and autoimmune markers, all of them were negative. And further, his CSF analysis was uh, negative. Now, we, we have to talk about the differential diagnosis of uh, middle cerebellar peduncle lesions. Uh, there are common causes, such as demyelinating disease or uh, ischemic causes uh, or neoplasm. Uh, there are less common causes and rare causes. Uh, I would like to show you just a few slides here about uh, this case one, he's a young man with um, a multiple sclerosis, presented with ataxia. You can see high signal abnormality on T2 images, in addition to incomplete enhancement or partial enhancement. Uh, this is a gentleman who was in his 50s with multiple risk factors, case B, uh, who um, had acute dizziness and uh, loss of hearing uh, related to stroke uh, in the ICA territory. You can see his diffusion weighted images and ADC maps that correlate with cytotoxic edema. The third gentleman is a uh, gentleman with uh, uh, case C, who is in his 50s, uh, developed a slight uh, left facial numbness followed by weakness uh, related to glioblastoma multiforium. And uh, case E is a patient who had uh, Susak syndrome, who had, uh, it's a lady who had a gradual loss of vision, uh, 
uh, encephalopathy and also hearing loss. We can see also uh, patients with other neurodegenerative diseases can have middle cerebellar peduncle, like uh, this patient who had uh, cerebellar atrophy, enlargement of the ventricles, and also uh, bilateral middle cerebellar peduncle lesions. Now back to our case, uh, going through all this differential, uh, she actually had uh, fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome, which is an X-linked disorder uh, related to expansion of the CGG repeat in the uh, familial mental retardation one gene. Uh, usually patients present with ataxia, tremor, Parkinsonism, dysautonomia and cognitive decline. Uh, women may be affected and common uh, MRI finding is the cerebellar uh, and uh, middle cerebellar peduncle hyperintensities. Uh, going through these cases, I hope, uh, will help all of you to uh, recognize that uh, when we see progressive patients with uh, coming over time and some uh, typical uh, lesions of the brain MRI, we really should do the work up and always, especially if their oligoconal bands are negative in the spinal fluid, just to be open-minded that the diagnosis of uh, PPMS may not be the case, and we should search for other uh, possibilities. Um, this is a case of a 60-year-old female, uh, had a progressive gait and steadiness for three years. Uh, over the last three years, uh, has been using a walker, and for the last year has been uh, uh, wheelchair-bound. Uh, she had, again, gradual uh, dysarthria and dysphagia and had uh, no bowel symptoms, but some urgency-related uh, incontinence. Uh, she had normal mental status exam. There was a gaze evoked uh, nystagmus with no limitation of extraocular eye muscle movement. She had normal motor reflexes and sensory exam, but mainly with tranquil ataxia. I believe all of you should uh, know this uh, patient. This is the MRI showed atypical, non-specific high signal normalities in the deep white matter. Uh, you can see other findings that there is uh, slight mid-brain and cerebellar and also uh, upper spinal cord atrophy. Uh, these lesions are not typical of MS. Uh, there are some findings here, but maybe not good on this uh, slide. So we will go to the next slide. This is a patient who had multiple uh, system atrophy with a typical bilateral middle cerebellar peduncle lesions, cross bun sign, and uh, cerebellar and uh, uh, pontine atrophy in addition to enlargement of the fourth ventricle. Uh, these are patients who all of you know present with Parkinsonism-like uh, picture. They are poorly responsive to L-DOPA. They have early autonomic dysfunction and the prominent ataxia. And MRI usually reveal the hot cross bun sign and also may show lesions in the middle cerebellar peduncle. You should differentiate them from patient with the progressive supranuclear palsy because of their early falls and uh, limitation of their um, vertical downward, downward gaze. Uh, this is a case uh, that uh, had been uh, diagnosed with MS. I'm just looking here at that time. Um, this is 20 year old gentleman, had a progressive imbalance and coordination for a few years. Uh, he was mentally fine until uh, grade four. And then in grade uh, six, he started to have coordination problems. Uh, when he became a teenager, he has some problems with uh, impulse control. He had progressive dysarthria, had family history of MS and ALS. His exam uh, showed uh, decrease in his mental status, mainly for uh, orientation, gaze evoked nystagmus, and he had this palatal tremor uh, motor and sensation was normal with ataxic gait. So when you see palatal tremor with ataxic gait, young individual, uh, your thought should be directed into certain uh, diagnosis. This is his MRI of the brain. Uh, typical um, high signal anomalies on the flare images, periventricular, both involving the uh, anterior, frontal and posterior with enhancement actually. Uh, um, in the middle cerebellar peduncle area, uh, high signal abnormality uh, um, in the cerebellar area and slightly uh, uh, mid-brain uh, 
medulla atrophy. Uh, this is a patient that could be diagnosed with MS, uh, but I should have actually put a polling question here to see your diagnosis. Um, this is actually a patient who was diagnosed with a progressive MS, but actually he has Alexander disease. We, uh, many of us know what is Alexander disease. It's a progressive disorder uh, of the astrocytes. Usually there is a mutation in the uh, gillary fibrillary uh, acidic peptide. It's an autosomal uh, dominant disease. There are variants of infantile, juvenile, and adult forms. Uh, the adult type is usually the one that presents with bulbar signs, hyperreflexia, ataxia, autonomic dysfunction, and sleep apnea. So sleep apnea and uh, palate myoclonus uh, in this age should lead to the diagnosis or thinking of Alexander uh, disease. Let's uh, move on. I will actually go now to this slide. Um, this is uh, a very beautiful picture from Jordan, one of the touristic sites. Uh, this is uh, Wadi al Mujib, a uh, small river that ends up in the uh, Dead Sea. Uh, hopefully, travels will be lifted soon so we can go back to visit home. Now, this is uh, a lady in her um, early 50s. She came with a progressive weakness uh, in the left lower extremity uh, for three years. Uh, then uh, the year before her representation had weakness in the right leg. Her exam uh, showed uh, at the time she was in a wheelchair. She has intact horizontal eye movement and no bulbar uh, findings. Her upper extremity exam was intact. And mainly the physical findings were involving variable degree of weakness in her lower extremities and there was a slight increase in tone in the lower extremities. Uh, this is her uh, MRI. Uh, it showed this tiny uh, one periventricular high signal abnormality uh, uh, on her uh, brain MRI, uh, one uh, posteriorly also, and one not typical periventricular also was noted. Couple of T, one black holes, and her cervical spine was clear, except at the area of the uh, degenerative disc disease. There was high signal abnormality. But if you can look here at her uh, T-spine, uh, maybe the projection is not good uh, and you cannot see it. But there are uh, high signal abnormality in the mid to lower thoracic spine and here in the upper uh, thoracic spine. So uh, this is a patient who came with a progressive uh, neurologic dysfunction uh, over a course of a, more than a year uh, had one lesion on her brain MRI, at least one and a couple of lesions in the spinal cord, fits the diagnosis of uh, PPMS, primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Uh, could there be another diagnosis or not? So other uh, tests were done to rule out mimics. Um, so her cell count was relatively normal. Uh, she had uh, one uh, CSF oligoclonal band, although there was identical band in the uh, serum. Her IgG index and uh, uh, IgG synthesis rate were also within normal limits. Uh, and her aquaparin 4 and MOG antibodies were unremarkable. And other inflammatory autoimmune uh, markers were all uh, negative, including uh, paraneoplastic uh, panel. This is the uh, 2017 uh, McDonald criteria for diagnosis of uh, multiple sclerosis in patients with a progressive uh, course, uh, primary progressive MS. Uh, we know that these patients should have uh, one year of disability progression, whether it is retrospectively or prospectively determined, such as this patient, plus two of the following, either one or more uh, lesion in the typical locations of MS lesions, periventricular, cortical, or juxtacortical, or infratentorial, in addition to at least two or more lesions in the spinal cord. Uh, the presence of uh, CSF oligoclonal bands is also uh, uh, another uh, supportive uh, paraclinical measure. So having two out of three plus the one year of disability progression um, gives us in her condition the diagnosis of primary progressive MS. 
Um, I will not go through these slides, but we know that there are uh, one approved treatment for uh, primary progressive MS, which is ocrelizumab. Uh, we know about all this data. Um, and uh, I'm glad also that there are currently treatments for secondary progressive uh, MS patients uh, that we can add to our uh, army to uh, defeat uh, the disease. In, in conclusion, <clears throat> Uh, it's important to have uh, an open mind when we see patients with progressive uh, central nervous system uh, disorders. Remember that the differential uh, is very wide and you should uh, focus on detecting the clinical symptoms and the signs to narrow your differential and come to the right diagnosis. Um, saying all of this, I like you to um, maybe tell me if you know where this beautiful picture is from. Uh, maybe we can go all to that. Maybe it's in, in Emirates. So please go ahead and uh, tell me what you believe. So we have almost uh, still people are uh, uh, chipping in their boats. Okay. So there is about 40% uh, of people uh, uh, saying this is Wadi Shoka in Ras Al Khaimah, UAE. Uh, almost 25% King Talal Dam in Jordan, 20% in Georgia, and 10% uh, in USA. Uh, we are almost 45% now in UAE. We'll end the polling here to save time. Actually, uh, this is a picture from the beautiful uh, uh, Jordan. This is King uh, uh, Talal Dam in Jordan. Um, I wish I have this home here or this one here. So uh, saying this, thank you all for uh, uh, being in this uh, program. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arian. Please stay with us, there are many questions. And those who are directed to you will be mentioned. Uh, I want to remind the audience about the evaluation form at the end, so you can get your CME certificate. Uh, we have many questions actually here in the Q&A questions box. We'll start from the beginning. Uh, there's a doctor here, he said, I'm consultant ENT surgeon, and I come across a lot of multiple sclerosis cases, and they come with complaints of dizziness and diplopy and headache. Uh, this is a fact, we, I'm happy to hear this, that another specialty is sharing with us. Any comments from any of you? Arian, ha, Ahmad, this is ENT surgeon. I think we like all the subspecialties to share with us their uh, involvement. Fre frequently we get reference from ENT, from ophthalmology, from urology due to CNS involvement according to the MS severity. So thank you, Dr. ENT. Uh, another uh, question, they want the studies or presentation. So I think the MCO will take care after permission from the speakers. The next question is, I guess this is to Dr. Reem. What's your impression about COVID influence or multiple sclerosis? I don't hear Dr. Reem. I think she answered this. Dr. Reem, are you there? Yes, as we said. Yeah, so this question, what's your impression about COVID influence on multiple sclerosis cases? Most of our MS patients behave similar to general population, even if they were on disease-modifying therapy. Uh, the exception will be patients who are severely affected by MS, who are advanced MS, they might have a more complicated COVID-19 infection. Okay, there are many. Uh, thank you, Ariem. Uh, the next question to you may be also the role of steroid in MS during the COVID. You presented this slightly, but maybe you can summarize it. Steroid in MS during the COVID. Okay, so uh, as we said, IV methylprednisolone can be given in a short uh, course for acute relapses. Uh, we can also uh, use an 
high dose oral corticosteroid instead of IV, as it's both are equivalent uh, in efficacy. Okay, thank you. Uh, question to Dr. Ahmad uh, and Dr. Reem. Is COVID-19 vaccine safe for MS patients? There we know no the vaccine is very good, but MS patients are groups, so please. <laughs> yes, um, we assume that MS patients behave similarly to general population in regarding to vaccine. It is the disease-modifying therapy that uh, might change their response in producing antibodies. So it should be individualized depending on the disease-modifying therapy that they are receiving. Thank you. Ahmed, any comments? Uh, what I would say is unless I'm aware, they haven't published the results of the COVID-19 trials in the UAE. So I usually tell my patients to wait until we actually have efficacy and safety on the, on the vaccine that's being offered because we're still trying, we're still learning. And then as Dr. Reem had mentioned, just because we have a vaccine, the medication you may take may affect your ability to make antibodies. And so I would say, let's wait first for the data to come out. And then we, it should be a case by case status, but where you look at what drug they're on and how it may affect. So I say, wait for now until we have more information. Yeah, thank you. Don't forget that uh, DMDs may inhibit the vaccine effectiveness on the body, so we have to be cautious till exactly. it is tested on in this subgroup. Exactly. Uh, question here, what is the good anti-inflammatory drug for a female 13-year-old diagnosed recently with MS, relapse and remitting, and she had optic neuritis? So we're talking about pediatric MS. I... Uh, can answer part of the question. The approved pediatric uh, therapy uh, in this heavy uh, disease and load patient, active disease, is fingalumod. Gelinia has been approved in 2020. And interferons approved for long time, for many years, for pediatric use. Maybe any comments from Ahmed or Reem? Uh, so as you had said, Dr. Jihad, thanks for answering the first part. Uh, Yes, for the, if you want the FDA-approved medications, the only one FDA-approved is, is Jelenia. Uh, you have the interferons as well. There have been some case reports looking at natalizumab as well as dimethylfumarate. There is a study going on with Abagio called Terry Kids, but that result is not out yet. They are currently um, evaluating, but that is a study that's ongoing. But to my knowledge, ocrelizumab, there's no studies. Rituximab has been used in children. Elmtuzumab has not been used in children. And cladribine as well has not been used. Yeah, thank you. Uh, question here, uh, please. Any idea about the number of MS patients with COVID came to Russian hospital and which DMD mostly they were on and what was the outcome? Uh, to answer this question, uh, we have more than 10 patients taking DMDs. They got COVID. All of them recovered fully. One of them was hospitalized, uh, quarantined actually for uh, two weeks, and all of them recovered fully. Uh, we have two taking latarizumab, two took cladribine, or uh, maybe three interferons. And uh, so they are on different EMDs, all of them recoveries. And as Dr. Reem said, uh, we don't have real evidence that DMDs will affect the COVID outcome. On the contrary, we have some DMDs which may positively affect the terminal stage or the pulmonary stage, the autoimmune stage, especially gelinia and metalizumab uh, and interferon. They may affect the pulmonary autoimmune phase of COVID-19. So we are looking for a registry in the UAE and in the Gulf to collect number of patients taking DMDs and they got COVID at the same time to see the outcome. So far, we have some uh, webinar a week ago with some people from different countries in the Gulf and there were no mortalities. All of them recovered fully. So we don't need to get panic from DMDs uh, during the COVID, but we have to decide case by case which DMD should be given to which patient depend on his uh, severity, uh, duration, EDSS, and so on. 
question to Dr. Harian. Are you there, Dr. Harian? Yes, yes. Is MS curable disease? Uh, we don't have a cure for MS. Uh, we have uh, uh, medication that can modify uh, the course of the disease. Uh, so if we used to have 50% of patients progress to secondary progressive MS after 15 years of their disease without treatment, now with these immunomodulating agents in general, uh, that 50% is only 20% now uh, with, uh, with the use of all these uh, therapies. Uh, until now, we don't have a curable uh, treatment. Thank you, Ari. And there's one question here. Uh, how common is MS in UAE? I think it's coming from different country. I can tell about two published studies, one from Dubai, one from Abu Dhabi, that the prevalence was 55 to 60 per 100,000, and the incidence was, was 6 to 7 per 100,000 per year. Uh, this is many years old. One was, the Dubai one was published in 2011, official study approved by Ethical Committee, and the Abu Dhabi was published in 2015. I think both studies should be updated. So hopefully this answered the question. The next question is, can someone recommend on cytometry protocol to sort astrocyte and microglia? Uh, this, for sake of time, we'll skip this question. If we have time later, we'll come to it. What about pregnant and non-pregnant women attending gynecology clinic? How to triage patient to refer home to neurologist as early as possible? What are the warning signs that make suspect MS? So the lady is talking about gynecology. Any uh, warning symptoms from gynecology clinic and patients having multiple sclerosis? We have to go to the presenting sign and symptoms, motor, sensory, optic. I'm not aware there's gynecological presentation of multiple sclerosis. Uh, any comments on this question? We know the ophthalmology, the ENT, the urology, the radiology, they refer cases to us. Gynecology, they don't refer cases to us because I'm not aware there's mm. any complication of MS. In some, um, unless, unless, unless sometimes if uh, there are some of our gynecologist colleagues who do urodynamic studies. So maybe if they have patients who come with uh, genital urinary symptoms, maybe they they can refer if they suspect uh, neurology. Yeah, disease. but yeah, yeah. this patient will go to the urology usually. Yeah. Before coming, we got many referrals from, uh, you are right, they have a spastic bladder or this synergism in the bladder, so they come to urology or to us, or urology even, or nephrology. Uh, we have 10 minutes, so we try to cover the coming questions. Uh, for the audience information, there will be two lectures tomorrow. One about the MS mimickers given by Dr. Mustafa, and the other one will be MS and infertility by Dr. Susan. So if you have any questions related to these topics, we can wait till tomorrow. Yeah, and please allow me here to, I, yeah, did, speak sure. to, Dr., I did speak to Dr. Mustafa Chakra, and our presentations are completely different. So yeah, he sure. will talk about completely different subjects, so it will not be a duplicate. You are right. I'm just mad because I see 50 questions here, so I'm afraid that many questions will be related to this. So I'm telling the audience, uh, mimickers and fertility, MS, will be answered tomorrow. The next question uh, to Dr. Ahmad. For his, thank you for your information, informative lecture. I am MS and I am I'm a secretary. I still recovering from my last uh, MS patient last week attack, and my neurologist wants to change my medicine beta for one since 2006. I have fear to go for change, but last, but at least now I understand how things are progressing. Why my doctor wanna make this step? So she's taking interferon. She's progressing. What do you think, Doctor Ahmed? Should she stay on interferon? Her doctor recommends to change it. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Jihad. 
Yeah, I'm reading the question right now. I think it's more of a comment. I think the patient's just thanking me for the lecture, and now she understands her disease more, and she, uh, thank you, and I understand how things are progressing and why my doctor wants to make the step. So I'm assuming by the question that she now understands the thought process of her doctor. At least that's how I understand it in the, in the sentence. Uh, you're welcome, Mona, for the, uh, thank you for the attending and thank you for the comment. Uh, but whether you need to switch or not, I mean, again, as we say, this is a case by case decision. It depends on how you're progressing, what your lesions look like, when your last attack was. So this is, it's hard to really say if you should or should not based on a webinar. This is something you need to discuss with your physician or you need to see a neurologist who sees patients with multiple sclerosis to further uh, elaborate on this question. But thank yeah, you for- Yeah, it seems Peter Frohan was working well for you for some time, but now there are more stronger medications suits your progression. So definitely it seems you should escalate your treatment we have more than 20 DMDs, more than betaferon, and came after betaferon. In the 90s, we have only interferons, but now we have more other medications. Question to Dr. Arien, the relation between MS and vitamin D deficiency. Uh, so it's an association uh, between uh, vitamin D deficiency and MS. We uh, do not believe it is the cause. There are some uh, papers that refer to the possibility that there is a shift between the Th1 and Th2 uh, lymphocytes in patients who are vitamin D deficient, meaning they switch from being anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory. But uh, it is not a casual cause, but it is more of an associated phenomena. So patients with vitamin D deficiency are advised to be uh, uh, given treatment and we use usually 50,000 units that's five with four zeros uh, every week um, and we like to have their vitamin d in the moderate to upper limits uh, uh, of the normal range yeah i think in addition the studies uh, large studies about vitamin d deficiency and disease activity especially the one done in australia some years ago confirmed that Vitamin D deficiency may play a role in increasing relapses and increased disease activity. So what Dr. Arian, we have said we do always our best to keep the vitamin D level in your blood normal. So 50,000 per week usually is sufficient for majority of people. Uh, here there is one about pregnancy and non-pregnancy. This question can be answered tomorrow. How long physiotherapy do you recommend for MS cases? And for COVID-19 positive cases, do I recommend face-to-face -face session or telephysician, Dr. Reem? Uh, do you recommend face-to-face -face visit of patients or telemedicine is enough for you since you are an expert now in this area? First, telemedicine, telephysiotherapy, as much as we can to reduce exposure to uh, other, especially if they are COVID positive, as she mentioned we would recommend to have continuation of their physiotherapy and not to interrupt it by using telephysiotherapy. Yeah, most of the uh, patients who are stable, they are happy to contact Dr. Reem and uh, to continue medication on the phone or video consultation. And those having some issues, relapse, suspected relapse, Dr. Reem will invite them to come face to face to evaluate them. But majority of our patients are, the, are happy to uh, have telephone, telemedicine, medication goes home, provided home without any uh, problems. Uh, one important question here, anesthesia precautions for multiple sclerosis patients. Anesthesia and MS, patient wants to go for a procedure under GA or epidural, is there any recommendation for any of you, the panel? Uh. I can answer that. There used to be a myth among anesthesiologists. They used to feel that uh, anesthesia can worsen your MS or trigger a relapse. This has been debunked, and there is no risk of having a relapse with anesthesia or general surgery. If you need it, you get it. Uh, there's, no, there's no worsening of your relapse or your disease if you have to undergo anesthesia. 
but that used to be a myth back in the past, in the 50s and 60s. It's no longer true as of these days. We have many, uh, you know, uh, patients with uh, morbid obesity, gross obesity, and they require bariatric surgery, whether a sleeve or under GA or whatsoever, because one of the risk factors for uh, MS activation is obesity, so should be treated. And we have many patients in our center underwent sleeve surgery, and they are doing great, actually. So surgery should be actually, again, decided face by face, depends on, is it cesarean section or obesity or basically I don't recommend cosmetic surgery for majority of our patients. I tell them if surgery is needed, you go ahead and we'll speak to your doctor. If it's not needed, then you don't need to go for it because sometimes those procedures, they may get relapses, especially if they are, are, are highly active patients. Question to Dr. Reem specifically is mentioned, Dr. Reem. In COVID, treatment for MS is same related to medicine or need to add some medicine apart from other COVID protocols like social distancing, or wearing masks, etc. So treatment for MS is same related to medicine? I mean, the question here, you you continue the same treatment on MS or you change it? Question is not very clear. It's from Shajila Raina. If she, if she means the related the protocol of treating COVID, it's usually with the infectious uh, disease unit from MS point of view regarding DMTs. As we said, if it's mild infection, we don't stop it. And if it's severe or require hospitalization, depend on the type of the DMT. Um, but there is nothing as, I'm not sure what she means, of add on medication. Thank you. So, uh, actually, the, I, yeah, please go ahead. And I mean, of course, the protocol of social distancing and wearing masks should be there, whether I'm a patient or not. Yeah, yeah. Now, the treatment of COVID itself, if you have a patient in the MS, usually the ID will take care of this. And uh, some of the DMDs, as you mentioned, Reem, we continue, especially interferon, uh, gelinia, lymphocyte is normal, metalizumab. There are some drugs, some DMDs should be withheld, withheld during COVID-19. So cell depleting agents should be withheld during COVID-19 active disease. Till they recover, then we come back to the DMDs. And this is what we do with Tysabri also, and uh, One question, hi, Dr. Moniba. Okay, this is not a question. Highly affected patients, with MS, when they get COVID, they can survive without complications. In our center, yes, all of them survived and all of them continued some tre their treatment, except what Tri mentioned about redosing of cladribine later, initiation of ocrizumab later, uh, till the patient recover from the COVID. We have two patients took cladribine. They uh, got mild COVID but we did the reinitiation, the second dose or the second year dose. Uh, so it should be decided case by case actually. But if they are mild COVID, we continue the DMDs, especially uh, gelinia, interferons, and if they have normal lymphocytic count. Uh, question here, because I'm coming, I'm spine surgeon. I was doing minimal invasive percutaneous procedure to left side of the spine, but some was complaining from right sided before one year before. So that leads, okay, so he's a spinal surgeon. He did surgery. He discovered that the patient have spinal cord lesion one year before doing the surgery. Any comments? I think there's a follow-up comment as well. Can patients have unilateral spine affection by MS for a long time? I, yeah, I think some people with MS, they don't always recover from their attack. So they may, you know, if, they, if they've had a lesion in their spine or in their brain and they have symptoms, they, we say they improve, but sometimes they are left with residual disability and that can last Really, it can last forever. It does improve with physiotherapy. 
it may improve with treatments, but it may, there may always be some minimal uh, residual deficits. Um, sure, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud, Al Mahmoud, spinal surgeon. If you discover the lesion in the spinal cord, what Dr. Ahmed said, I would investigate further before doing any surgery. Maybe we have more uh, spinal uh, MS lesions. We should explore the brain and do the uh, full workup to be sure this is NMO or multiple sclerosis or something else. So my personal yeah. advice, refer the patient to the neurologist or MS specialist. So he will be of great help to guide you and you guide us in surgery. So one question from Galaxy is a big question. What is the main reason of multiple sclerosis? This will take us two days to answer it. But maybe briefly, we can hear any, any comments. Uh, I'll, I'll yes. just take this one. I mean, we, we don't know really the uh, primary cause of MS, but just think of it as an individual who has probably genetic predisposition. And then there could be some environmental factors, whether it is vitamin B12, vitamin D deficiency, uh, some uh, infectious agents uh, that you may have been subjected to. Uh, there have been talk in the past about certain viruses or bacteria. All of this in an individual who has genetic predisposition will create uh, an autoimmune response where the body will attack the central nervous system and that will drive your lymphocytes to be activated and cause these MS lesions and inflammation. Thank you, Dr. Ali. So, for the, so it is inflammatory uh, lesions in the central nervous system, brain, optic nerve, spine, triggered by immunology, autoimmune process. And we have been three factors, genetic, uh, viral, environmental factors. Uh, recently added vitamin D deficiency as one of the risk factors. What Dr. Arian said, better Epstein virus is one of the factors. Smoking, obesity are some of the risk factors, environmental risk factors, which may trigger, but they don't cause, but they may activate the disease. Yeah. We have another, uh, what, how important is rehabilitation for MS patients? Very yes, important, very important. Studies have shown that physical therapy and rehab can be as effective as medication. So uh, they go together. So if you have MS and you have disability or you, you have problems, weakness, rehab is very important. So you should be doing it, whether it's rehab or exercise. Stay active. Yeah, this, this is extremely important. It's more important than seeing the doctor for medication to do exercise and follow a program, rehabilitation program. One question here is MS terminal disease. No, it's not terminal disease. It's not cancer. It does not kill. But what Dr. Arian said, the, uh, maybe the house, the, sorry, the uh, lifespan is shortened for some patients who are not treated. The quality of life might be affected, but it's not a fatal disease. We encourage all patients to take their DMDs to avoid going on to disability, severe disability, but it's not terminal disease. Uh, those who are not treated, they may progress and they go to a secondary progressive phase with bad EDSS, their quality of life will be affected and their life might be shortened. The span of life might be shortened, but it's not a fatal disease. Question here, uh, is seponomoid mesant available, recommended for MS patient following cabbage? Mm. Patient having cabbage, open heart surgery, can he take seponomoid, mesant? I would say uh, with... I know it seems. I'm sorry, that's... that's you got to worry about the cardiac issue. At the end of the day, you do have to get cardiac clearance. And we know this, even though it's not highly affinitive to the cardiac muscles, it still has some cardiac effect. So if your heart is that weak, I would probably avoid it or you better get a very detailed cardiac evaluation and stress test. This is not someone that, that I, he needs to be checked out fully. And then no, you have to look at the risk. And then it's still with a big, big question mark. Cause I don't I know if we have the, that answer. 
Yeah, I think in the trials, uh, I don't think any cabbage patient was included, but maybe Novartis can provide more information later. Uh, one question here, uh, physiotherapy is repeated. Prevalence of depression in MS, which group of antidepressant medication is preferable? As far as I know, more than 40 to 60 percent of MS patients, they have depression, and they don't usually uh, tell you, I am depressed, we should ask about it. And presentation can be fatigue, tiredness, uh, abnormal mood, behavioral changes. So definitely depression and mood changes should be directly questioned by the neurologist till we diagnose this. And we have many DMD, and many antidepressants can be used. Any additional, because of sake of lack of, sake of time, I'm answering some question which I know. Any comments from the panel? <laughs> nope, you answered it. Okay, so next question, how do you choose the course of treatment medication to use in specific patients? Uh, from Lean Tan, this is a very big question. Uh, should we decide it case by case, depends on age, sex, pregnancy planning, uh, heavy lesion load, MRI, disease activity, EDCS, we have more than 20, 30 factors to decide which medication to be given. But I can tell you two things. The only uh, treatment for primary progressive is ocrelizumab, the approved treatment. And the uh, most recent treatment approved for secondary progressive is sibonomoid, mesant. I'm not aware of other medication abroad in these two medications. But in relapsing remitting, we have plenty of treatment which can be used. This question here to Dr. Ahmed. I'm running fast because of time. How reliable is MS ProDiscuss tool, which you spoke about it? Uh, it? It has been validated. It's been tested. So in, re in regards to reliability, it's a proven technique, a proven tool that has data behind it to show that it actually is accurate. So I would say it's pretty reliable. But you also, the yellows where you have to kind of take with a grain of salt, that's the patients that you need to follow closer. If you're red, you probably do have it. If you're green, you don't. I think, yeah, I think it's excellent digital tool yeah. to capture the patient during the transitional phase from relapsing remitting to second progressive. If you search in your clinic, doctors, and this is what happens with me, we have many arguments on many patients. Patient coming walking, but if you ask him, he say I can walk 20 meters and I stop. You apply this MS through discuss tool for him. You'll find he's secondary progressive. 100%. And it's very nice cartoon and you can show it to the patient. Patient's walking, but he cannot walk distance. He has invisible uh, symptoms of disability like depression, bowel, sensory, fatigue, pain. These things cannot be examined, but you can capture it on the digital tool, MS Pro Discuss. I recommend all neurologists to use it dealing with MS patients. It's very helpful actually, and you'll be surprised that the percentage of secondary progressive patient in your clinic will be increasing. Because, yeah. because again, the invisible disability symptoms can be captured with this diagnostic tool. It's a cartoon, it's like a toy, you play with the patient. Yeah. And I remember I was putting um, in front of the patient, putting the symptom signs, uh, apply, I told her, you know, there are three colors on this tool, green, amber, and red. Red is secondary progressive, amber is transitional, the green is relapsing remitting. So I told her, let's try this. We answer the question, the MRI, the symptoms, pain, bowel symptoms, depression, then it turned to be, she's going for depression, for secondary progression. She started crying, oh, doctor. Am I really secondary progression? I said, don't worry, there is treatment for you. And we are going to start her soul on sepanomoid, which is approved treatment for this condition. Uh, we have other question here. Uh, low, lower levels of uric acid had been found in people with multiple sclerosis. Isn't it, Dr. Arin? I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware to Ahmad. I'm not, I'm not aware, and I don't know what that I means. don't know they are lower levels, maybe higher levels. 
But maybe you should provide us with this, Dr. Mahmoud Lukman, with this uh, uh, result. It's interesting to know about it. The next question from Hathra Arif. I am a physiotherapist. What is the most effective treatment for MS adult patient on the first attack? So again, first attack means uh, when you say MS, so this is relapsing remitting or CIS because we stop seeing CIS if the CSF is positive, according yeah. to McDonald 2017, it goes to relapsing remitting. So all the panels opened for relapsing remitting. Any comments from the panel? <clears throat> I think if every case should be uh, evaluated uh, case by case. Uh, there are many prognostic factors as mentioned, including uh, the age, the, rate, the, the sex, the number of lesions, uh, type of the attack, whether it is sensory or motor, uh, presence of spinal cord lesions or not. Uh, then there is the comorbidities in the patient. Sometimes patients may have certain uh, diseases that do not allow us to use therapy A or B or C. So we should have put that in the context when we are talking to the patient. Um, so it's, it's a very good question, but it cannot be answered. Uh, and then sometimes those more effective medications, uh, although there is no head-to-head -head trials between some of them, they may have also different uh, side effect profile. So when we decide at, as physicians what is the best drug for this particular patient, we base it really on multiple factors. Uh, so I cannot answer this question. Yeah, I think what we tell the patient when he say what is the most effective, I'll say, there is nothing called the most effective for you. There is the most suitable for you. So it depends on multiple factors, what Dr. Ali mentioned, number of lesions, EDSS, uh, age, sex, onset, treat, history of treatments. So we have high efficacy drugs, which are the third category Dr. Ali mentioned. These are alumfizumab, ocrelizumab, and natalizumab, and recently cladribine. These are the highly effective drugs. And we have the first-line treatment, I would say first-line treatment, which are interferons, terfenamide, and dimethylfumarate. And we have the intermediate drugs, which are gelinia, fingolimod, and sibonimod, and uh, natalizumab. So you can categorize which uh, treatment patient wants the, 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 your patient needs highly effective drug, or she can go with uh, low effective drug. So it should be case by case, and what is suitable for you does not suit other patients. I cannot give a patient with CIS jump to alumtizumab or patient with highly effective disease, EDSS 5 or 6, give him, for example, Covaxone. So it should be uh, tailored according to the patient situation. I think with this, we are uh, coming late. There are more questions, but tomorrow, there will be second day, so there is a chance to ask most of your questions, which we didn't answer it, especially the uh, fertility, the mimickers, pregnancy issues. I skip it because it will be answered in depth tomorrow. And uh, with this, I think we will close this interesting webinar by thanking the speakers, number one, Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Reem, Dr. Arian, and thank, thank the chairman, of course, and thanking Dr. Suhair for organizing this excellent meeting. And of course, we thank Novartis and Emens, and we thank MCO for their logistic support. Thank you all, and wish you a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, and good night, everyone. Okay, good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.